<laughs> uh, so for today's Quantum Theory Seminar, we have Jun Yu Lu from UChicago and many other places, as you can see. And he's going to be talking about uh, quantum AI, near-term, and fault tolerance. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm very glad to attend this seminar, and then I'm very glad to be invited and to give a talk. So actually, I'm located in University of Chicago, but maybe some of you didn't see me before. So I was partially supported by Canon Center, but I was primarily located in PME, so which is nearby the nearby building where people are doing quantum computing and quantum physics are there. And then, uh, so, uh, but uh, I also have some connections to the Cardinal Center, so I could be regarded as a local person. So I get supported by those institutes and uh, academic institutes, like uh, including U Chicago and IBM. Um, yeah, and, then, and also Chicago Quantum Exchange, which is currently a hub for quantum computation. So I partially uh, comes from a quantum background. So maybe this seminar was uh, not usual comparing to other talk. Uh, I thought that many of those talks are focused on more on high energy physics or condensed matter theory, but um, I'm, I will more talk about something about quantum version of computer science. So basically we call it quantum AI from near term to full tolerance. Uh, so it is partially based on some of my works and also some works in progress. And uh, if you're interested, you can uh, check it out later. And then this is a brief introduction of me. So I was born a while ago. <laughs> Maybe this is not that important. And later I get a degree in Caltech and so I come here for a postdoc. That is my work line. So when I'm in a grad school, I'm supervised by those three persons, where two of them actually are high energy physicists. And uh, another person previously is a high energy physicist, but later he moves to more into quantum information science and John Presco. And then uh, I also have sort of a hybrid background. So in the past, I learned some high energy physics. And then later I turned more to like quantum information and machine learning. So by um, understanding algorithms using some physical principles. So, uh, so then um, today's talk was designed more to be like a, to some of my works that is more related uh, to, I mean, the language of high energy physics or quantum physics or quantum field theory. So those are some of the work I did, especially um, after I come to uh, University of Chicago, I was collaborating with people here in a quantum team mostly. And I'm, I'm interested in how to use physics understanding to improve our knowledge about algorithms in data science. And that will include in the knowledge about the hardware and also the software or the algorithm and from quantum and classical. And today I will mostly talk about uh, some algorithms we have developed developed in machine learning, uh, quantum machine learning. And then I will discuss more in more detail later. And uh, primarily those two works. One is about so-called quantum neurotangent kernel for a near-term vegetable algorithms. Another one is about quantum enhancement of some large-scale language models in the full tolerance area. So those are the work that uh, I, I will primarily introduce today. So the outline of the talk is simple. And firstly, I will just give an introduction and uh, give introduction to any of them. And then uh, to both of the topic I will talk today and I will finally give some comments. And in any time, please feel free to like interrupt or like ask questions. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so firstly, I will give a very brief introduction about quantum machine learning. So uh, by definition, and quantum machine learning is a combination of quantum computing and machine learning, so which is a uh, promising area in active development. So a usual understanding of this word quantum machine learning is meaning that you are running some machine learning related or machine learning like algorithms in some quantum devices where you develop a quantum counterpart of classical machine learning, which is going to be running in some quantum computers. So there are some big picture problems about this field. So firstly, 
what is quantum machine learning? I think maybe different people might have different definitions. So that is really a field that is really young. And why we do quantum machine learning and where is the advantage? So why we do quantum instead of classical machine learning? I think uh, classical machine learning recently was a very hot topic. Maybe some of you have heard about chat GPT, which is very powerful to and writing you academic papers and then helping you writing grants. And it's a very good writing assistant, but uh, uh, and then it seems already powerful enough. And then in that case, why we need quantum? And that is something that people are thinking or exploring about. And what is the typical problems for quantum machine learning? So is there any like success example? And what is the primary database for quantum machine learning? If we are going to do uh, quantum machine learning, there must be existing some database for you to do so-called supervised learning. And then the question is, well, what is those database? Are they quantum data or is they are classical data? For uh, those as a question, and also what is the uh, quantum machine learning algorithms? So in the algorithm level, what are the most successful algorithms? Classically, we have stochastic gradient descent, which is very powerful. But what is what is a quantum machine learning algorithm that is most useful? So there are two related topics that is a little unrelated, but uh, but some people also call it quantum machine learning. And also, I think they are like helpful for the machine learning in the narrow sense I was talking about today um, as well. So one example is that some people are studying learning quantum states. So basically, you want you have a quantum states, and then you want to learn some properties uh, by accumulation of data of quantum states. So sometimes this is also called quantum tomography, which means that you are going to like uh, get some information from a given quantum states and it, it is studying how many minimal amount of copies you need to obtain for that quantum state to get the enough information you want. So another uh, very hot topic is so called machine learning for quantum physics. And this is also some people call it quantum machine learning, but so those are mostly about using classical machine learning tool to study something about quantum physics. And they are all very interesting topics, but in this talk, I will limit it more uh, to the topic in the narrow sense about quantum machine learning, which is really wrong some quantum algorithms for machine learning. So there is another um, uh, classification of a quantum machine learning that is related to quantum algorithms. So uh, the development of quantum algorithms and also quantum hardware. So currently uh, uh, we are in so-called the NISC era, which stands for near-term intermediate scale quantum, oh sorry, noisy intermediate scale quantum. So which means that currently uh, quantum computing are able to like arrive at uh, of order like 100 qubits, However, so it's uh, the scale and uh, to go further and to do accurate computation with sufficient depths uh, will be limited by quantum noises. So in that sense, right now, our quantum devices you can all see in the market was noisy. Uh, so, so then that makes it hard to run some useful quantum algorithms. And eventually we expect to implement quantum error correction code to all those quantum devices and hopefully we will go to this full torrent quantum computing error, FTQC, where we are able to um, control the error and mitigate or correct the error and then have a good um, computation and have a good computational, reliable computational tool. So similarly, I mean, classical computing also have, have done this path and before inventing classical error correction codes and classical computers are also relatively hard to run. But after that, so we are able to use it reliably every day, even for PCs. Uh, so, and then, so we are right now running from this NISC era to the FTQC era. The question is um, uh, how, how much it will affect uh, the story of quantum machine learning. So actually, this is an interesting question because classical machine learning actually utilize noise. So actually, in uh, classical machine learning, the most uh, successful algorithm is so-called stochastic de gradient descent. So why we have, have to call it a stochastic? Because we have to add noise by hand. Uh, so we just put noise inside and then run it 
and the noise basically means you are generating some random number in the algorithm. And then you, we find that that actually performs better. So in some sense, uh, machine learning algorithms are resilient uh, towards the noise. Uh, so, um, so that means that uh, maybe as the near-term platforms are able to already test some quantum machine learning algorithms. So that is uh, the origin of this, in one of the original motivation for inventing so-called variational quantum algorithms that I will talk about later. Uh, but this is something like also a big picture problem and it might be nice to give you an introduction that uh, currently we are like running from NISC era to FTQC era. And it might be interesting to think about how quantum algorithms uh, or quantum noise uh, um, and uh, uh, will be like appearing in this quantum machine learning algorithm or like quantum algorithm in general. So, and uh, my talk today will start firstly from NISC where I will talk about uh, the theory I developed uh, in the past with collaborators uh, so, on so-called quantum neurotechnic kernel. So the part of the reason that I think this is suitable for this seminar is that uh, I realized that this is actually uh, one of the uh, closest language uh, that uh, from the quantum uh, machine learning theory towards uh, uh, quantum field theory. So actually it provides a, a knowledge uh, so provides a so-called so first principle theory of quantum machine learning. And then that in some spirit, it was similar to quantum field theory. So, uh, and then we actually get inspired by classical machine learning that I will talk about later. And then it will have some unique features in, in terms of quantum. So, uh, okay. So before that, I will briefly introduce uh, in the NISC era, what are quantum algorithms or quantum machine learning algorithms people are thinking about. They are so-called qu variational quantum circuits or variational quantum algorithms, VQA. So what it means is that you will have a shallow circuit, and this is actually a quantum circuit where the, and then you are repeatedly applying some rotating gate like uh, parameterized by classical variable theta, and then followed by some C knots. So this is something called a variational quantum circuit. And uh, basically it is made by the following formula where you have WL, which is like um, some fixed gates that is not related to any changeable classical variable, you just fix it in your devices. And another part was e to the i theta x, where x is some permission operator that is implementable. For instance, it could be Pauli's, and then it, uh, and the, the circuit becomes local rotation with respect to uh, the, the angle theta. And this is a typical uh, variational quantum ansatz or variational quantum algorithm. Uh, and then what we are going to do is that we are going to create some loss function with respect to this unitary U and then by some measurement, say that we are measuring some operator O and, um, and uh, with respect to the states that's created by U. And then we made a loss function, which is a function of U and then the function of theta. And then we do gradient descent or some other classical optimization technique to optimize theta such that it could, um, could uh, achieve some local minima of your loss function or hopefully achieve a local minimum of the loss function. So that is the idea of so-called variational quantum algorithms. And a typical example is so-called variational quantum eigen solver, VQE. So that is applied for near-term quantum computational chemistry that people are able to like solve some examples of, for instance, like hydrogen atoms or other atom eigenstates, or even for quantum many body physics and quantum field theory. And they can try to solve the ground state and some low lying states based on these kind of assumptions. And uh, uh, this, this circuit also has another name and which is called quantum neural network. So quantum neural network is the same as this guy. And then it is something, and the, the circuit itself, the circuit diagram looks like a neural network. And by this name, you could you, uh, realize that maybe it's, could, you realize it, it's useful in machine learning as well. So you can create some supervised data that I will talk about later. And so using those uh, variational parameters as standards and uh, to train your network to get some local meaning. Do you think about the theta's as discrete choices or continuous? Uh, as a, currently, it's a continuous choice. So theta is continuous. It's a continuously changing variable. So that's why we are able to like use stochastic gradient descent. 
Yeah, because you have to take derivatives. If it is discrete, you cannot take derivatives. But so there are methods that are changing, that making them discrete. For instance, you can choose all those gates to be uh, in a Clifford group, and you you choose your uh, you choose Clifford circuit. And in that case, uh, it was a discrete choice because uh, the group is finite. Uh, and there are works uh, about making discrete choice uh, of those two and, and uh, of those kind of circuits too. And the and the algorithm will be different. Yeah, thank you. And then so of course so we can create such a circuit and do quantum experiment. But the question is uh, why it works. So uh, currently people only have here some very heuristic argument. Uh, it seems that this could like fit arbitrary function because it looks like a Fourier expansion. So we know that Fourier expansion could fit some general class of functions. And it seems that it could play a role as a classical artificial neural network. And then there are some other reasons and the people try and actually and get some success. And then potentially because this number of Hilbert space maybe is exponentially expanding with respect to the number of qubits, so maybe some people feel that, okay, so it has the potential to outperform classical. Uh, however, so there is no that much deep understanding uh, about variational quantum elements beyond that. There are some people even believe that it actually may not work. So this is a result in a sort of a no-go theorem could bear a so-called barren plateau. Uh, and then I would uh, recommend you to read this paper, and, uh, but, but this may not be like uh, related to the topic that I will talk about today. So, and then I would say that our theory about quantum neurotangent kernel uh, will provide a novel understanding about the barren plateau problem uh, that's discussed before. Um, sorry, just to clarify. So the, yeah. the L is the layer? Yeah, so here L is the layers or equivalently the number of trainable zetas that you have. So if you have L classical variable zeta you are going to train, then L will be that, that number. But it can also be different um, depending on your Q0, Q1, Q2. Uh, what is Q? Sorry. Oh, uh, Q, Q, Q are, sorry, Q are qubits. I mean, Q0, Q1, Q2, that means that you have uh, input some qubits, zero and one. And this is a quantum circuit diagram. So a Q0, Q1, Q2 just means that the zeros qubits, one's qubits, and uh, so second qubits. And then it was uh, like a three qubit system. And then, and then you apply uh, a sequence of gates on those qubits. Uh, so it is not related to the uh, qubits. Q are the states. And here they are like a quantum circuits or operators applying on the states. Do you want the Ws to be like local? Uh, Ws, good question. Ws are not local. Uh, so they cannot be like a, only lo located in a single uh, in a single qubit. So otherwise, that uh, it will, the circuit will be a direct product of uh, all those individual qubits. So you have to create some minim minimal amount of entanglement. So here is an example, or you, you could use C0, so which is uh, like entangling the qubit zero and qubit one. And then it could be non-local that uh, if you have like a, a one dimensional lattice, for instance, and then you could couple that depends on your hardware. If it is in the superconducting system, it's going to be locally connected by swaps and also by C0, so those two qubit gate. But if it is in a neutral atom, actually, you could move uh, the atom. And people find ways to move atoms and then directly move from the first atom to the end of the, uh, to the, to the, end of the chain. And then using this way, you could create a non-local interaction. Question. Yeah. Um, so for classical neural networks, it's known that um, if they're deep enough for the activation functions of general and uh, you can approximate any function in some sense. Yes. Are there any theorems like that for these? Yes, or? yes, it has. So a similar iteration that I have, uh, I, I, I already um, I already stated is that this analyze itself is similar to the Fourier expansion of a given function. So we know that Fourier expansion will fit almost everything. So and then it will have a similar like a universal approximation theorem and in this context. Good. So, okay, so let us continue if there is no other questions. So then the first uh, question 
that also uh, uh, and also was this uh, appear actually in the discussion was how to choose this variational elements. So you could choose so C naught, you could create a monotonal interactions, and you could also change in your like local rotations or like even global rotations. How to choose your variational elements? And before you are running the experiment, so there are infinite kind of neural networks, quantum neural network you could design. And then if we choose a virtual and that's how good the convergence will be. And at least in some limit, can we like get some numerical or analytical intuition about those questions? And during the training, and what is the dynamics looks like? And dynamics means that you regard the number of iterations as time uh, during some optimization process. And what does this dynamics look like? And then furthermore, what is the difference between classical machine learning and quantum machine learning? So they are also the big picture question regarding this so-called variational quantum algorithms. And this is a primary topic that I want to address uh, in, in our work of so-called quantum neurotechnical kernel. So the idea is the following, the following. And right now you could say that the, the notation is a little more comparing to quantum field theory, a little more similar comparing to quantum field theory or like a physics. Uh, so you can firstly create a state and a similar uh, to this rational uh, elements that I was mentioning before. And as an acting on some known, some ground state, uh, sorry, not ground state, but some preparable state you could have in a quantum circuit. Uh, and so you could create a, such a loss function. So, which is about some observable O, say that you want to, uh, if you if your task is to minimize the Hamiltonian and find the ground state solution, uh, and then so this O could be your Hamiltonian H, and O zero is the arbitrary number, uh, and you want to make it close to, and maybe or you can set it to zero, and so this is this loss function is called mean uh, mean square loss. So, uh, and if you create such a loss function, so you could call the saying in this bracket to be epsilon. So this is a terminology in linear regression. And this is the called uh, the receder training error. So which is the difference between the prediction in the left and the optimum you want to achieve in the right, where in that difference, I call it epsilon. And then, so the gradient descent equation uh, by definition uh, is this. So this fancy D, means the difference between uh, two, uh, two time slices and the two, two different time. So each time the theta L at T, uh, at T plus one minus theta L at T, and it is equal to minus eta times such a derivative, where eta is so-called the learning rate, where you could regard it as a small positive number. And then the derivative of the loss function over theta is just taking the derivative of the above formula. So this is the definition of the algorithm that people usually use, which is stochastic uh, gradient descent or gradient descent. Right now, there is no stochastics, uh, but so this is just a definition of a common algorithm that people use uh, in classical or quantum machine learning. So, and then the point of this so-called quantum neurotechnic kernel is that you could actually, instead of studying the variational angle theta, at each, uh, at each theta, you can sum them together by thinking about the difference between uh, the updates of the receder training error. So um, instead of studying theta uh, at, at updates in different times, and you can, you can study epsilon instead. And then in the first order Taylor expansion, uh, it will be given in like a, a contribution from the difference of all the rational angle theta. And then if you plug this formula back, it will give you this formula. So, and this quantity, which is a sum in the middle and which is a square of two, like a, a, a square of the residual uh, training error, make a derivative over the variational angle. This quantity is called neurotechnic kernel or in this case, quantum neurotechnic kernel. So, I will introduce uh, in more detail later in the general case to say why it is a kernel, but at the moment it is only a number, a positive or non-negative number. So the reason, the part of the reason that we are studying this is because, so if this number is fixed and you could say that this equation was exactly solvable, say that it is a constant and eta is also a constant, epsilon is updating over time, and this equation was similar to the differential equation where 
um, epsilon derivative, and then that's equal to minus a constant times epsilon itself. And the solution is exponential decay. It's a, it's a e to the minus eta times t, right? So times this quantity times t. And then in the discrete case, uh, which is a discrete update, and we also have the closed form solution. So then you can you can you can say that if this quantity is constant, and then you could uh, like uh, directly solve the equation, and it will partially like answer the question I proposed earlier: how the dynamics look like, and even how to choose the variational elements. So uh, so so however, so I make an assumption that this quantity is a constant. So, which is referring to that the derivative over theta is a constant in some sense. That means that epsilon is linear in theta, and then this basically is a linear regression problem. So, in this limit, so this equation and it becomes actually a linear regression algorithm to optimize some rational angle theta to get the minimum, local minimum of the loss function. So, uh, however, so in general, this quantity, sorry, there's a pointer uh, behind you. Oh, you turn, you turn, around, turn around, turn around by the black one. Yeah, no, no, well, the, yeah, there's that one. Well, there's a physical one, I think. Oh, uh, okay, one yeah, I yeah. see it. Yeah, yeah. okay, anyway. yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so, uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, so in general, so we can derive such a formula. So, we're uh, about how the neurotangent kernel k depending on the variational angles. So, they are like a highly fluctuating in those variational angles, which is beyond the linear reg regression in general. So where we usually call it representation learning. So the reason that we are using the term is uh, in the learning context, when the variational angle is changing, that means, uh, or the near tiny kernel is changing, that means that you uh, keep uh, extracting information from the data. So, um, and then, uh, because this K is actually highly fluctuating, uh, then the question is, uh, can we still use that formula or is there any at a limit where this K is approximately a constant? So yes, so the answer is true. And the first, uh, um, first uh, part and, uh, of that answer is very simple, which is so-called the lazy training case. So if your rational angle theta was around a constant, then the theta does not change. And then the neural tiny kernel K was almost uh, do not change. And the, they are like almost a constant. So basically, this will happen around the end of your training process, where you keep updating your rational angle theta at the end, it almost does not change. So then by the definition, the neural tiny kernel K uh, was almost a constant. So and then at the leading order of this approximation, you will get this formula, which is still an exponential K. So, and you could actually do perturbation theory regarding this by expanding your learning rate order by order around the end of training. So, and this is also similar to the spirit of physics, where actually this is the first order result of the uh, of, of, uh, of the perturbation theory, but you can in principle expand it to arbitrary orders. And then it will be given by the free theory part and the interacting theory part, where the free theory was the same before, but the interacting theory part was uh, decaying a little slower. So originally it was an exponential decay um, function, but right now it was a, a linear function times an exponential decay function. And that is the first order of solution. And in principle, you are able to like solve all orders. So that is the first uh, very simple element about this uh, lazy training. Uh, however, so you could you make uh, some more like uh, advanced uh, assumptions. So instead of assuming that this variation angle theta is a constant, you can assume that there are like some random ensemble of this variational uh, of this variational and that's basically used if you assume that you are random matrices and then this kind of assumption might give you some intuition about how the neural tiny kernel behaves at the initialization and during dynamics so then we what we could do is to use so-called k design assumptions so this knowledge was inspired by cryptography and by core physics where people from the quantum chaos community have studied a lot about this kind of assumptions. So basically the idea is the following. So the question is, if you uh, want to randomly choose 
an element from the unitary group and how it will look like. So the K design is uh, uh, by definition, so that it was an uh, approximation of a uniform distribution on the, uh, on the unitary group. So uni uniform distribution on the unitary group, we call it power measure. So uh, the, the, the K design assumption was actually the case moments equivalence of the higher measure. So if K is larger, so then that means that the ensemble itself you choose about the unitary group was closer to the higher measure. So, so then by definition, K plus one design is always a K design. So here we make assumption, make, make an assumption that uh, if you choose your virtual assets such that your unitaries are distributed according to some K design uh, measure, and then you basically could average um, against this near tangent kernel K. And what you find is something, uh, um, some phenomena that is, has some analog about uh, in the classical machine learning, which is so-called large width theory. And uh, in this case, and uh, it, is, uh, uh, it, it, it is a similar analog in quantum. So what we find that is that for the analysts I'm talking about before, if you make the K design assumptions, and then you could directly compute the average of K, and that was proportional to L, the number of training, trainable parameters. So if you compute the standard deviation delta k, uh, and then if you have a similar formula, but uh, the scaling was square root of L, where L is the number of trainable parameter. And then you make delta k divided by k bar, and then you will find that this is surprised by one over square root of L. So this indicates that if L is much, much larger than one, so that means that the standard deviation comparing to the average was almost zero. So that indicates that if you follow this assumption, then uh, as long as L is large, you randomly choose an ensemble. It will be almost like this, this, uh, this number if you compute the near chain kernel. And then that is consistent with my assumption before where K bar is a constant during the evolution of a gradient descent dynamics. Uh, and then uh, if K bar is a constant, we will still have a protective behavior and then this variation delta k will serve as a perturbation theory as the next order. So that is the idea that here we are talking about, so which is a deep random uh, neural network, where the word deep, and here it means that you have a large L. Is there an analog for a, a classical deep network? Uh, yes, so it's an analog of a classical wide network. So actually, uh, classical network has a different structure uh, compared to quantum network. So classical network it has a nonlinear activation function in the middle. So it not only has depth, but it also has width. So the number of neurons in each layer in classical neural network is called width, and the number of layers is called depth. So in classical language. So actually in the quantum language, so there is no depth, there is only width. So deep classical network corresponds to, oh, sorry, wide, wide classical network corresponds to deep quantum network. So, but this is was just a terminology. So here is a deep random neural network, quantum neural network corresponds to large width classical neural networks. And this uh, one over L expansion was nothing but this one over width expansion where people doing classical machine learning are talking about. But the theory was different. If I say that this uh, classical neural network large width theory was closer to the uh, to the theory of uh, large n in in the gauge theory ADSCFT context, and then this this model was more similar to a matrix model. And I mean the BFS is matrix model in high energy physics. Uh, the reason is because we are basically doing the matrix integral, and uh, if you are doing if you study like some, some low energy QCD and uh, sometimes you make the assumption of random unitary as well. So those strongly chaotic behavior and you can write them in terms of metric theory. And here those observations are basically from the, uh, the Feynman diagrams similarity uh, between, the, uh, between, this, um, uh, be, between this higher measure integral and the traditional Gaussian distribution and ensemble, uh, the, the Gaussian distribution and, and weak uh, contraction 
in the quantum field theory language. So this has some physics connections where actually uh, you could, if, if you use matrix model language, probably you could view the similar theory. Uh, but uh, I mean, but here is so everything was uh, clear concrete, which is that uh, I was just sampling those random unitary U. Uh, and then, so this, uh, this, this non-trivial scaling, scaling of the square root of L that appears here that corresponds to uh, cancellation of this needing all the uh, non gaussianity when you are trying to compute delta k and then the the air of all the LP is cancelled because of this uh, weak contraction behavior. So this is some physics understanding and uh, about this phenomena. But currently, it's a different uh, subject. It's more about computing. Yeah. So here. Uh, thank you very much for the, for your question. But here I'm I'm going to promote the problem from a simple uh, scalar um, um, problem of optimization towards uh, a supervised learning problem. So the first step, uh, if you are doing actual machine learning, and then you have some data set, and you could encode your data set into a state, a quantum state, and the x delta right now is a data and it could be a classical data and then you can encode it as coefficient of some given states so this step can be realized efficiently with the assumption of quantum random access memory if it is uh, if it is a uh, uh, classical data and that was a device that people are trying to make especially here uh, in Chicago I mean but uh, currently currently people are still working in progress on um, uh, realizing those devices. They are like fast version of quantum memory that will allow you to complete that process. So, and after that, you are able to like uh, uh, construct some predictions Z, which is uh, an expectation value of some operators with respect to the states with uh, very strong elements. And then you could uh, create a similar quadratic loss function as before. And then right now the neural tangent kernel becomes a matrix. So that's why we call it a kernel. So that's because it was really a matrix. And you can prove that this matrix is uh, symmetric and also uh, positive semi-definite. So this is an, in a similar sense of the kernel method in supported vector machine of classical machine learning. Uh, so, but here, it, 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 so it is really a non-negative kernel so that's why we call it near any kernel because it, it uh, firstly it's a turn kernel and secondly it takes a derivative, and then you could study a similar theory and compare it to before. And then right now it's in a matrix version where you still have this uh, exponentially decaying behavior. And actually you can like uh, try to compute uh, perturbation theory as well, but in the learning case it was a little bit more complicated. Uh, it was related to, uh, so if you are doing the learning case, you might study the, uh, um, the probation at the next order. So in the next order, we're, we call it quantum meta kernel in this case. And then you could take not only the first derivative, but also the second derivative uh, of the, of the receiver training error or the prediction with respect to some rational angle theta, where here I write it as phi. So doing a rescaling, but you could do some similar calculation too. And those calculations are very similar to what you did in the calculation of statistical field theory or, uh, or the, uh, or the, um, or the quantum field theory. Uh, so, but here I will not uh, um, discuss too, um, that many about this because the picture is almost the same and about before, but instead of looking at this analytic formulas, so we can look more on the numerics. So here we also did some numerical simulation regarding those examples where we did a very simple uh, experiment of, with three qubits in IBM devices uh, two years ago. And then we run simulations and we experiment and actually observe this frozen version of the quantum neural tangent kernel at the late time of training. So as I mentioned For before, what do you measure with the circuit? Uh, so we just measure spin operators. Uh, so all of these, all local these. So just uh, measure all local these. Uh, that is the quantity that we measure. So the, the you mean like the o, o operators in the yeah, and I'm, I'm right now I'm setting yeah, right now I'm setting O to be Z. 
this is a poly operator, the, uh, the third poly operator. Uh, and you could, the theory does, uh, to, to make the theory to work, it does not matter what uh, the operator O is, but this is an example of the experiment we run. And then in the noisy case, uh, it has some fluctuations, but we could still roughly identify some frozen region of the near tiny kernel that's consistent with the circle prediction. And uh, furthermore, so I was mentioning that, so there is a concentration experiment that we did. So which is that we sample over some random rational angles. And uh, if it is a K design and assumption, namely the, the angles is sufficient random, and then you could find it will concentrate at some value that's predictable. So those different colors are theoretical predictions comparing to the, the, the average of this numerical results. And actually, there's a more clear picture about this where we uh, we we have here where we find the scaling consistent with a theory where the neural tiny kernel average scale as a rational uh, uh, non, non, proportional to the rational parameters, and which is a linear scaling. And this scaling was one over square root of L. So this was verified. So according to the the theory that we had before, and actually. Because of this, in the relatively large L, we could get some accurate prediction uh, of, the, of the gradient descent process. And uh, here it is a perfect exponential decay residual training error process and during the evolution. And then, and then you could check the neural tank kernel. And in that case, was almost a constant. Um, so, and this constant was predictable just according to this figure. So there are some other words that's related to the topic. Um, and so I will briefly mention it, but uh, if you are more interested in that topic, maybe you can check it out. So uh, just now I mentioned that- Can I, uh, can I ask a question about sure. frozen neuron tag? Like, isn't that just saying that if I'm going to a minima, the second derivative would be constant in the, in the neighborhood of the minima? Uh, like, so, sorry, what do you mean by second derivative? Like if I have a loss function in some high dimensional space. Yes. Like the partial derivatives would have like some fixed form as I go close to the minimum. Right? Uh, so we have to, to make the, uh, that's a good question to make the theory to work. So we have to use a quadratic loss function. So if you change it to another loss function, it's a logarithmic loss. Then there is no analytically solvable example of that. So uh, then to, to track it analytically, we have to use a quadratic loss function. And the actual reason that's, if you want to use the physics to interpret it that, that's because the quadratic loss function, that's more like similar to the quantum field theory, which is a free theory. So in the free theory, you have P squared, Q squared, or X squared. And then in that case, it was exactly solvable. It's a similar situation here. So if you use quadratic loss, it's solvable. But if you use logarithmic cross entropy loss, it's not solvable in the theory. I see. And like quadratic loss is typically the thing that people do on uh, people do different losses. So that really depends. But uh, a quadratic loss is one of the most common and the simple loss, at least for supportive vector machine or linear regression. People do quadratic loss, right? So it's one of the most common loss. So people are trying to generalize it to other losses. But so those are like a theoretical prediction of machine learning, which is I mean, and as long as you can find a toy model that could and then they could actually work, that is uh, that is a progress because uh, actual model also might have some distance from your theoretical assumption. So here it is more restricted to toy models, and if you want to do some theoretical analysis. So, okay. So just now I was mentioning that uh, the noise uh, might help. Um, so so the machine learning performance. So that was because of the stochast uh, stochastics. So the reason, so I didn't introduce this before, but we have works about noises as well. So if you introduce noise, and actually they are an analytic way that could show you the noise actually could help in many cases that could arrive you better performance. So the, one of the reasons is because the noise is something like a metropolis algorithm that could allow you to go away from the saddle point. So the saddle points are some points that we actually don't like in machine learning because they are not the local minima. 
to get the local minima, so you might have to use some extra mechanics. Otherwise, it might be co concentrated towards the saddle point. And the idea is to use the noise and adding some random fluctuations will help your uh, uh, optimization and uh, to be more successful by driving it to a local minima using those noises. So this is an actual real example that we have performed. So actually, and this is a small amount of qubits and it's a, it was a six qubit example. So we're actually, we get better performance and uh, towards the local minima instead of stuck it into a saddle point, which is the noiseless. So the topic about understanding noise and how to make use of them and how to correct them in some applications is a very hot topic in quantum information. Uh, and, and today, probably I don't have that many time to talk about them, but if you are interested, you can check my papers and about understanding the noise and how to correct them. So finally, I will mention uh, briefly uh, because of the limitation of time. So, so about some fault tolerance regime where how quantum computing can help you solve uh, the machine learning problems. So those are based on some ongoing work with uh, some collaborators here and also uh, a Germany, uh, German collaborator, Jen says it, and, um, and also some students and postdocs here and also with my advisor here, Yan Jen. So um, the idea uh, is the following. Uh, so, um, so HHL is basically one of the paradigm which stands for Harrell and Hasidim and Lloyd. So, which is uh, a very important paradigm or algorithm in quantum computing. So, this is a principal paradigm because it solves a problem which is called sparse matrix inversion. So as long as you have a sparse matrix and uh, you want to compute its inversion. And uh, actually people find that quantum algorithm have some enhancement or even exponential improvement uh, in the metric size of A. So for matrix inversion problem and uh, quantum algorithms could perform better, much better than the classical or all classical algorithms that we know. So, so then that will tell people that as, as long as you have a full tolerant quantum computer that could run this HHA algorithm, and if your subroutine of your algorithm has matrix inversion, then you are able to uh, like arrive at some success or some advantage. So uh, actually we are trying to benchmark and in some application of HHL, but uh, those numbers are like gate contents. If you want to apply HHL uh, to, towards some real examples, and you could say that the, they would use a large number of gates, Although it is a computationally efficient algorithm in theory, but in practice, it's going to be very hard to run in practice. So they are like more a theoretical research about utilizing the so-called HHL algorithm uh, in quantum computing and machine learning. So, and then now I would discuss how this algorithm was related to stochastic gradient descent or to general machine learning algorithms. So the reason is about the following. So um, we are making use of some previous algorithms that make use of so-called HHL algorithm uh, for solving the nonlinear differential equation. So those, uh, those uh, algorithms are, could also like outperform all the classically known um, algorithm and for solving nonlinear differential equations. And a requirement is, is that it has to be di dissipated. So the reason is the following. So in order to solve such a problem into a quantum computer, so if it is a nonlinear problem, like a nonlinear differential equation, and you have to firstly linearize it because quantum mechanics is linear. And then so this people find a technique could work, so called the Kalerman linearization. So which is uh, an area that uh, in the dynamical system and uh, aerospace engineering that like, in the last century, people find how to linearize a nonlinear differential equation towards infinite amount of linear differential equations. Um, so uh, if it, the system is dissipative and then the, uh, the linearization error is controllable, it's exponentially decayed. So that's kind of why that you can, for a given nonlinear differential equation, 
and then you are able to linearize it and turn it in, into a quantum computer, and then you turn it to an HHL algorithm, so which is corresponds to star, sparse matrix inversion. Uh, and furthermore, so we find that this method actually could work uh, in machine learning. So here is some brief intuition about that. So, uh, so actually, there are some heuristic arguments about the structure of our, of our brain, so which is dissipative. Uh, so the first argument is that the gradient descent dynamics is a dissipative process. Uh, if we could treat, treat gradient descent as dynamics, so they are open first order systems and uh, cannot be described by Lagrange mechanics. So this is easy to prove. And uh, the equation I showed you before, the gradient descent equation, so they are like uh, systems that uh, has to be open. They cannot be a closed system. And also, uh, there, is another, um, there is another intuition that says that our brain is dissipated, uh, and then, which is about biology, that uh, the brain um, needs to forget things in order to remember things. So in that case, the information is lost, and the process is hard to invert. And it, because it is not unitary, it's a dissipated process. So these are all like arguments, and there are other like theoretical arguments from the feature information related arguments in so-called information bottleneck theory of machine learning, and also some arguments about periodic, periodic activation functions in classical machine learning. But the conclusion is that our brain is actually dissipative, but I mentioned that dissipation leads to quantum advantage. So then that means that if you combine this together, that would give you the potential that how HHL could solve some generic version of the uh, uh, classical machine learning problems. So um, our finding is that firstly, the technique towards the differential equation I was mentioned before actually could be generalized to ordinary difference equations. So actually the stochastic gradient descent equation is a set of like a difference equations. So, so then that means that we are able to actually using HHL uh, to solve those machine learning related problem. So, um, uh, so uh, there are like some technical uh, requirement to make it work. So you have to ensure the dissipation happens. And in practice, that means that during the gradient descent, your Haitian matrix has to be positive definite, or it has to be almost positive definite. And for instance, around the local minima, so you can easily say that the Haitian spectra are positive definite. But in general, it may not happen. So you have to do some experiment to find which regime you actually have this dissipation, such that you could receive such a uh, quantum enhancement. Um, as the impact of this work might, might be um, uh, might be significant in the sense that um, right now we know that training large scale classical machine learning models and it might be like a, a very huge uh, very huge um, consumption because they are very uh, non sustainable at the moment. So, for instance, like uh, this Chat GPT or GPT three, those models like it has a one hundred billion trainable parameters. Uh, and then if you are able to use quantum computer or even photon quantum computer to improve them, that's going to be a big gain. Uh, so that is part of the motivation of the work. And here it's a simple like, calculation that shows that uh, actually if you have put a log in front of those uh, 100 billion numbers, and then you will get a significant gain. So, and then, so in our work, actually, we are trying to explore, so as I mentioned before, which regime of the classical machine learning model is dissipative. And then we actually uh, take a look on the some 100 million parameters of a classical machine learning model and try to compute its Haitian spectrum. And then that could tell you in some region of the gradient descent dynamics, you actually could achieve some possible quantum advantage. Uh, but uh, later, you may not be able to uh, um, have your system to be sufficiently dissipative anymore. So we create a hybrid quantum classical algorithm. So that part of the algorithm was quantum, part of the algorithm is classical. And so if we notice that there is a quantum advantage, and then we will run them in the quantum computer. And then other, uh, around this point where we find that uh, Z cannot give us quantum advantage, then we stop them and download the data from the quantum uh, devices to the classical processor and solve them classically. 
So that is the idea. So of so-called our quantum enhanced large scale machine learning model. So probably I should introduce in more detail about this, but today because we're limited of time, so probably I don't have that much time to introduce them. But if you have, if you are interested in those topics, and please, uh, um, we we can discuss later. But uh, uh, this is uh, the, the, our work shows that there are like a non-ignorable amount of time. Where actually you, your model is able to like receive some possible quantum advantage, and we have tested them to some relatively large scale parameter. So this is a computationally vision model. So a 100 million parameter is already large. But uh, for language models, if you want to claim it's going to be a large model, it has to be like a 100 billion. And uh, at the moment, we don't have that resource to do that experiment. So we only did a small scale, smaller scale experiment, but we find that the quantum indeed could help, in, indeed could help in some of the processes. Uh, so uh, let me give some final comments because we've already run out of time. Uh, so um, quantum machine learning is a promising area. Uh, and potentially quantum devices could be useful for large scale classical machine learning problems. So a summary is that in the near term, virtual circuits are primary algorithms running in the NISC devices uh, with noise. And theoretical tools like quantum neural tangent kernel are very helpful to, de de um, to design those uh, devices using first principle. On the other hand, machine learning algorithms are sometimes robust against the noise themselves. In the NISC era, noise might even help us to improve the performance and avoid the settle points. So in the long term, HHL algorithm is one of the main ingredients for quantum machine learning algorithms. So we design an end-to-end -end HHL application for sparse dissipative machine learning algorithms and shows that there are potentially exponential speed up, which are universal, robust, generic, and provable. So um, there are some other uh, lessons we can gain and from this talk, the knowledge about theoretical fundamental physics that people here like and love are very helpful uh, for quantum algorithm designs and even classical algorithm design, including quantum chaos, quantum field theory, and black holes, which is related to some of the machine learning theory I was introduced earlier. So there are some other works that I have done and uh, in the in in the, in the past and. Uh, and um, and that's I, I I'm happy to communicate further with you guys and later if you are interested. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, and we have a startup, and actually the startup is about uh, more about AI plus cybersecurity, where it has some ingredient of quantum inside. Uh, but currently, our largest market is about uh, uh, using AI enhanced cryptography and blockchains, and to solve some security problem. Um, in the market. So if you're interested to any of the ideas that I was talking today, it seems uh, so, 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 so it seems some of you might be interested and, and then please feel free to reach out and then I'm happy to discuss with you. At the later part of the talk, I run a little fast because I, I noticed that the time is really limited. <laughs> So sure. uh, I wanted to ask you a question about the HHL bit, which is, is there an effective way? So you, you are bringing a linear thing down to a log, but you would have to upload the data to the machine, great. which would be a linear time. Right. So, so, so great. So this uploading is actually a magic. So this uploading of this process requires a, in general, it requires a machine so-called quantum random access memory. So that could achieve you the time complexity on log n. So if you have n data, it will upload it. It's like the parallel computing that could upload the data in a logarithmic amount of time. It will sacrifice the space though, but uh, it will have a logarithmically fast. Even if you have n data, you will have log n time to upload all the data. So, uh, but in general, so uh, is this, this, this machine does not exist. Uh, at the moment, but uh, some people believe that in the future it will get and um, get uh, um, people will invent such a machine. And currently, it is only at a low scale. Actually, uh, some experimentalists um, uh, in University of Chicago, and actually including David Huster, who has already left and come to Stanford, so they are probably one of the best group for creating quantum random access memories in the world. But uh, currently, the technology was only for 
like near-term uh, small-scale experiments. But people might be able to invent this machine for a large scale in the future. Uh, on the other hand, our algorithm actually, some, there are some details that does not require that. We do not necessarily require such a quantum random access memory. So the answer is that as long as your states are sparse, so which means that most of the components are zero, they are only like a few non-zero components. Then you are able to efficiently upload them, right? So the process itself is related to all arrivals, but at the uploading process, as long as it is sparse, and so at the moment we are still able to like maintain the poly poly polynomial or exponential enhancement of the quantum algorithm in the HHL part. So HHL does not have restriction to sparse states. And also, so that's why we, I partially, I, I call it a sparse random, uh, sparse matrix inversion. So matrix itself has to be sparse as well. So the general matrix inversion, I know is like polynomial for like a dense matrix, but if- uh, That depends on your model. If you use ResNet, for instance, in classical machine learning, so they are, if you put, transfer it in such a language, it's going to be very sparse. And, and the reason is because it's an, it's a almost linear except uh, one single point. Because uh, uh, ResNet is uh, made by Renew Neural Network, which is that uh, smaller than zero is going to be zero, and larger than zero is going to be linear. So it is a scale invariant, almost linear function, except one point. So if you transfer it in such a matrix, it's going to be very sparse. It almost only has a diagonal, diagonal component. Thanks. You're welcome. How do you go from the sparse matrix inversion to the dissipative or what? Uh, good. So, so that's why I feel that maybe Probably I need a separate talk to explain this because this was really technical. Uh, so um, just now that I show you that the, uh, the gradient descent is something similar to this. And so that was a uh, matrix multiplication. And uh, that uh, if you define this as a matrix, and then this is a matrix to the T, uh, it, it's a matrix to the T, which is a matrix multiplication problem, right? So uh, this, uh, this could work in a linear regime, but here it, it, we find it work in general, but here we just only want to get some intuition. So, and this, uh, the matrix inversion would come to this, but you can find ways to, to, to make it to be, become this. So, but uh, this, this will evolve some mathematics that uh, to transfer from this to this. But uh, actually, people show that as long as you are able to invert matrix, you are able to fastly uh, compute the matrix power. So basically, uh, sto uh, the stochastic difference equation is basically keep uh, multiplying matrices. And then if you are able to multiply them fast using quantum computers, you are able to like um, get a quantum enhancement. No more questions. Let's thank the engineer again.